Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I know we're all very worried about Alan. I'll talk so we won't all watch him walk down the stairs. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I am Pastor Elizabeth Ann. I am the associate pastor here at Generations of Grace, and I'm so excited to get to share a message with you this morning. If you are paying a little close attention during worship, you may have seen the same psalm on the screen, and that is because that's the psalm that we're talking about today, Psalm 100. It is a psalm all about worship. It's often entitled a psalm of praise or a psalm of thanksgiving, but either way it is supposed to initiate or call us in to worship of God. The psalm is about something so important to us as Christians and as churchgoers because worship is not only something we do on our own, but it's something that we believe we are called to come together to do. But this very important psalm is only five verses. You saw every single one of them already this morning. Hearing how many verses, seeing how small this little psalm is in your Bible might make you think there's not a lot there. But do I have news for you? This psalm is one of the most beautiful and important representations and interpretations of worship that we can find. This little bitty psalm can be divided into two sections. Can you believe that five verses has two sections? It's very exciting. Each begins with a call to praise, worship, or thanksgiving. And then each calling is followed by some sort of of reasoning or proof that teaches us about the faithfulness of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's begin with this first section, Psalm 100, verses 1 through 3. You can open your Bible there, pull out your phone, or I'm just going to read it to you so you can listen that way. Psalm 100, verses 1 through 3. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before the Lord singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. God made us and we are God's. We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. Now, because this psalm is only five verses and it's often used as a call to praise, it can be easy to kind of read through this quickly and get into praising and worshiping God. And that's fine. That's a great thing to do. But if you read it too fast, you might miss what happens in verse 3. In this verse, and we'll see a little bit later in verse 5, we get a statement and then a proof of that statement. And what I mean by that is that the psalmist writes one fact about God and then says, this is why that fact is true. In verse 3, he does that three times. So in verse 1 and 2, we're called to shout with joy to the Lord, to worship the Lord with gladness, to come before the Lord, singing with joy. But are you wondering why we can make a joyful noise to the Lord? Why we shout to the Lord? Why we worship with gladness? You see it in verse 3, because we know the Lord is God. Now, we've talked about this before, but monotheism, everyone say it with me, monotheism, good job. That's just a real big fancy 10-cent word that means you believe in one God. So put that word in your back pocket. If you want to seem smart, just throw that around sometime, monotheism. And as Christians, we believe in one God. This idea, monotheism, was not common when the Old Testament was written, especially in the case of when and where the Israelites lived, the people they were surrounded by, and the people they interacted with. There was sort of just this idea that each group, each religion, each, each people had their own little g-gods that they worshipped and tried to please. 
And these little G gods controlled everything from the weather to the harvest to your health. We talked about ones that controlled the water and the river a few weeks ago. And everyone just kind of agreed, we have our gods, they have their gods, they have their gods over there. We'll just do our thing here, they'll do their thing there, and everyone will be happy. So for the Israelites and for Psalm 100 to say that not only is there one God, but this one God is the one true, actual, real God, that was just quite shocking for the time, to be honest. We see this throughout the Old Testament, and we see this reflected in even how Jesus was treated in the New Testament when he said that he was God, right? He was called a blasphemer because there's only one God. Those people that said that didn't get the whole story yet, but thankfully we have that whole story. And we see this idea of one true God in Psalm 100. We have this statement that we are to acknowledge that the Lord is God. The one true Lord is our God. And how do we know that? What proof do we have? Guess where you find it? In verse 3. First, we see that it is God who made us. We find this story in the beginning of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And let me read to you from Genesis 2, verses 7 through 9. And then we're going to skip ahead a little bit to verses 18 through 22. And I'll tell you why when we get there. Genesis 2, verses 7 through 9 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The next little part talks about where some rivers are and where this garden was, so we're just going to skip ahead to the rest of the creation part in verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make something who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. The Lord God brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no one just right for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. So here we have a very personal creation story, unlike some of the time when uh, the Israelites were living. You can sort of imagine this idea of God sort of coming down from heaven, right? And kneeling down and getting dirty and making something. And that something that was made was humankind. Isn't that a beautiful story? A beautiful idea of a personal God that desires to have relationships with each of us. And it's still true today. God created each one of us every single one of us, personally and uniquely, everyone in this room, in this state, on our continent, in the world, everyone that you know and don't know or agree with or disagree with, God made them just like Adam and Eve. Make a joyful noise to the Lord and worship the Lord with gladness because the Lord is good and God has created each one of us. The next statement of fact about God is that we are God's people. Now, that means that we are chosen by God to be God's own people. To tell us more about what this means, let me read to you what Paul wrote in the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, 
we have received an inheritance for God, from God. For God shows us in advance and makes everything work out according to God's plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, that's us, have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that is promised and that God has purchased us to be his own people. God did this so that we would praise and glorify God. Now this is so amazing and so important and I really don't want you to miss it. What Paul is saying is what we believe today and it shows us how we can read the psalm now. When the psalmist wrote, we are God's, we are God's people, that was just for the Israelites. Remember, the Israelites were God's chosen people, the people that God loved and protected and rescued and provided for time and time again. What happened when Jesus came was that he began to teach that God didn't just choose one group, but God chose us all. God chose all of us from the beginning to be God's people. Now I know for the competitive people in the room, or if you're into the Enneagram, my Enneagram four friends that want to be special and different and stand out, this is a little hard to hear, <laughs> that we are all chosen, not one more than the other. But what this means is that no one group, no one country, no one race, no one denomination, no one person is more chosen than the other. When we read this psalm today, we need to remember that the Lord is God and we are all God's people. Now what this also means, and this is also very important, is that we choose for ourselves if we accept God. We talked about this, or I talked about this a few weeks ago, but the choice is ours to make and ours to follow. It's a choice that no one can make for us and no one can take away from us, which, at least for me, is both freeing and kind of scary at the same time. God has chosen me, but I choose to accept God. But it's also, at least for me, very personal, and it makes my relationship with God that much more special because God knows me. God knows the desires of my heart and gives me opportunities to use those desires to bring glory to God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord and worship the Lord with gladness because the Lord is God and we are God's people. The final reasoning we see in this verse to show why the Lord is God and is that we are the sheep of God's pasture. If you haven't noticed, this whole sheep, shepherd, pasture thing is all throughout the Psalms. We've already talked about this a lot too. Most likely, this is because many of the Psalms were written by David, who was a shepherd before he became king. And what better way to explain God and God's love and the ways that God provides for us than with something that he understood and many people would have understood in that time. In Psalm 95, just five psalms before Psalm 100, it's written this way in verses 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for the Lord is our God. We are the people God watches over the flock under God's care. In Psalm 95 and 100 and so many others, we see that we aren't just any flock. We are God's flock. We are under God's care. I don't know how much you know about sheep, but they need a shepherd. They need someone to herd them around 
to show them where to eat and drink and lie down, to protect them. And we kind of need a shepherd too. And ours is God. God watches over us like a loving shepherd. And not only are we the sheep that God chooses to watch over, that God protects and provides for, but did you see that we are the sheep of God's own pasture? God's own pasture, this world that God created. We are here and we are being watched over in God's own pasture. Make a joyful noise to the Lord and worship the Lord with gladness because the Lord is good and we are the sheep of God's pasture. There's two verses left in Psalm 100 and this is our last section, verses four and five. Verse four calls us to enter into God's gates and God's courts with thanksgiving and praise, giving thanks to God. But why can we enter with thanksgiving and praise? We find the answer, surprise, in verse 5. For the Lord is good. And here we get two reasons why we know that the Lord is good. Let's look at verses 4 and 5, finishing up Psalm 100. I'll read them for you. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving. Go into God's courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise God's name. For the Lord is good. God's unfailing love continues forever. And God's faithfulness continues to each generation. Why are we to give thanks and praise God? Because the Lord is good. And how do we know because God's unfailing love continues forever. This is some of that good news we talk about finding in the Bible, right? It's not just any love that God has for us. It is an unfailing love. A love that is reliable and constant. That never changes and never wavers. But did you see it's not just an unfailing love. It is one that continues forever. The definition of forever is for a limitless time and at all times. And I love that because that's what God's love is for us. It is one that has no limit and that is always loving. It's explained in the book of Romans this way. And this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. Romans 8, 38 through 39. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Give thanks to God and praise God's name. For the Lord is good. God's unfailing love continues forever and nothing can separate us from that love. But there's one more important line to Psalm 100. We're called to give thanks and praise to God because God is good. Because God's unfailing love continues forever. And listen to this last line. Because God's faithfulness continues to each generation. Faithfulness is loyalty. It is binding. It is true steadfast and devoted. And God, that same God from verse 3 that made us, that chose us, and that is our shepherd, is faithful. Did you notice in Psalm 100 that there is no condition to God's faithfulness? 
God is not faithful because of our actions, because of what we say yes or no to, because of our worship and praise. God's faithfulness continues to each generation because God is good. And we worship and praise God because of God's faithfulness. The Gospel of John puts it this way in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. From God's abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. We can read this psalm today with this truth, that Jesus came revealing God's unfaithful love, unfailing love, and faithfulness. Woo, we almost went a very different way. (laughs) So let me say that again. Let me stand here and read it. That Jesus came revealing God's unfailing love and faithfulness and took the place for our sins. And this faithfulness is one that will never go away, that is available to be accepted by all, and that will continue to each new generation. Give thanks to God and praise God's name, for the Lord is good. God's faithfulness came through Jesus and continues to each generation. The psalmist teaches us in Psalm 100 why we should shout for joy, why we should acknowledge that God is good and praise the name of God, why we give thanksgiving and offer praise. We are told why. But did you see that we are never told when or how? There are no conditions set about worshiping in Psalm 100. And what I mean by that is that we are called to worship and we are told about God's love, faithfulness, that God is good, that the Lord is God, But we are not told when to worship. We're not told where to be, who to be with, what emotional or physical state to be in. We're not told what to wear, what to sing. And I would bet it's because we are to always be worshiping God. And as so many of us right now might be feeling defeated, overwhelmed, too tired to get out of bed and face the world, too afraid to hear of new ideas or hear about someone's experience because it could challenge your own, ready for things to start back, afraid of what might happen when they do, mourning all the losses or the hardships of a year that, man, really started with some promise. This was going to be our year. If that's you, if that's us, if that's me, I invite you to worship God no matter what. Offer thanksgiving with gladness. Come into the courts of the Lord shouting with joy, praising the Lord's name. Why? Because God is good. We are God's. God's unfailing love and faithfulness continue to each new generation. There are no conditions because these truths are all we need to call us into worship. And we have a chance to do that again now. So I'd like to invite the band to come on back up. And I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And as we're taking some time to sing, I want to invite you, if you need to worship through song, do that. If you need to worship through prayer, do that. If you need to worship through silence and meditation, do that. If you need to worship with a friend, that is okay with you not being six feet away from them, grab their hand and worship with them. 
Think about the times when you shouted with joy to the Lord, whether in good or bad times. There are no conditions for you to worship today. Let's all pray together. God, we thank you for the truths about your goodness, your love, and your faithfulness that we find in Psalm 100. God, we believe that you are the one true Lord, the Lord that created us, that chose us, that protects us, the Lord that has love for us, that was shown through Jesus, that will never fail. God, I ask that all of us would continue this time of worship in a way that is appropriate for us and that reflects our individual and personal relationships with you. God, be with each of us as we learn to always be worshiping. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand if you can. Let's continue our worship.
Lord. Let's all go there. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That was awesome. Thank you, Pastor, for a great message and a great reminder. I had someone this week tell me that I'm a strong person, and um, I'm not. <laughs> I am a weak person, but my strength comes from the Lord. And the more I praise Him, the stronger I feel. It's kind of an amazing thing, isn't it? So what a great reminder this morning. I've got just a few announcements for you this morning. Um, we're continuing our collections for the Lebanon Special School District. And so there's already a nice little stack of Band-Aids and baggies out there starting. So if you want to help, we're collecting um, the Ziploc kind of baggies in quart or gallon size and any kind of Band-Aids or adhesive bandages, if you don't want the brand name. And that way, the school nurses are going to use those to make up care packages for all the classrooms. So, um, so please continue to bring those in this month so that we can help out there. Also, this weekend is um, a weekend of prayer at our schools throughout the Nashville area, and we have joined with First Priority, as we have done the last four years, to pray on the campuses of our schools. Yesterday, we covered three of the schools in our area. We were at Coles Ferry Elementary and um, Walter J. Baird School and Castle Heights Elementary. And today we are supposed to be at Sam Houston Elementary and Winfrey Bryant Middle School. So if you're available to go and join the prayer teams there today at 2 and 2.30, um, please go and be a part of that. I won't be there today because of family obligations, but my friend Brooke, who is the head of the Christian Theology Training School here in Lebanon, has agreed to be, she and her husband and their team will be there to pray as well. So um, if some of you could represent generations, that would be great. The important thing is that we know that, that our students and teachers and administrators are being prayed for. And um, yesterday, Susan and I ran into a teacher who was loading in her classroom, and she almost cried 
when we, you know, we just were walking by and we're like, we're praying for your school. And it stopped her dead in her tracks. And she said, we need your prayers. And I think more than any time this year, they do. And so we're praying for a good school year and also for God to be glorified in our schools, as amazing as that would be, right? And so um, we're thankful for all of our teachers, Bess, especially you, as you go to school. And <laughs> um, it's not an easy year, but you're not going alone. And we are all behind you, right? Right. All right. The, um, the last Friday of the month is our family movie night. And we're going to continue watching The Chosen. I did purchase the DVD set, which helps fund the next season of The Chosen. And means that I don't have to get up and push skip ads every time. Which is because <laughs> that was a little annoying. I was like, I'm buying the DVDs. So anyway, we're going to be watching two more episodes, at least of that, this fr- um, the last Friday of the month. So I hope you guys will make plans to attend. Invite people. This is a great time for people to get out and do something social. And we can do it here and still socially distance. And so that's a great thing. And also, don't, rem- don't forget that at the last Sunday of the month, we're going to have a Generations Update. And so we would love for you guys to stay and be a part of that. But if you want to stay, if you could fill out a connection card, and there are some on the information kiosk in the lobby. And just let us know. And on the tables. Thank you, Susan. And you can just drop it in the offering bucket so that we know how many lunches to provide that day. And this is almost like us having a carrying dinner because we're going to eat together, which we haven't done in several months. And um, I'm super excited about that as well. Um, and so, and also, don't forget, as you leave, if you'd like to make an offering, the buckets are there by the door, or you can continue your giving online. Thank you to all of you who have been so faithful to tithe. The lesson that I have learned is that when God wants to take care of the church, he takes care of you. And then when you're faithful, the church does fine. And I've seen him do that throughout this time, and it's an amazing thing to experience. So thank you all. Before we go this morning, I would like for you guys to join me in prayer, if you will. Um, I don't know if I can do this. We've just had such a hard time lately. And, um, Alan's having surgery tomorrow. Susan, can you come up here and help me? Um, so I'm sorry. It's worship. I'm blaming it on worship. <laughs> Alan is going to have surgery on his knee tomorrow. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, he ruptured the tendon that goes across here. So he can't use his leg. Um, and the doctor said it had to be surgery. So we are praying that as he reattaches that tendon, that it will work. And, um, and just trusting that God will be there with him. So um, would you come up and pray with me? We're going to anoint him with oil. Scripture says, is any of you sick? Go to the elders and have him anoint you with oil. Have them anoint you with oil and pray over you. And so that's what we're going to do. If we weren't socially distancing, we would all kind of gather around. Um, but I'm just going to ask if you'll just lift your hand towards Alan as we pray. Um, then we're just going to ask God to take care of him. Okay? Because he, next to Jesus, he's my rock and I need him. Right? So will you do it? as
thank you. See, that's why we need each other, so that when we can't get through something without blubbering, your friend comes and does it for you. <laughs> there are great things in store, right? Even for the school year and for our household. And um, I know that every trial we go through is just an opportunity for God to be glorified. And so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that, God. <laughs> but thank you all for being here, for um, just for being an awesome church. And I hope you have a wonderful week and uh, many blessings along the way. Let me pray over you before we go. Father, thank you for each one who's gathered here today. Thank you for our guests, Lord, who have come to worship you as well. And we pray that your hand of protection would be on this group of people as we leave. But we pray, Father, too, that you would be some, do some, doing something in us that goes even beyond our own safety and protection that your light would shine in us, that we would have conversations that draw others towards you and that they would see how much love you have for them because of the love we show for them, Lord. Thank you for your church. Thank you for letting us be your people and your sheep, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, have a great week, everyone. Jesus leans on prison bars. Jesus swinging in my yard. When we learn the things, when we learn the weak, when we trying to hide anything I wear it on my sleeve I wear it on my sleeve 